Today we're down to um, module nine is up here. It's in the wrong section. I'll move it, but it's module 10 today, mobile app investigations. So, um, all right. So when you install an app, it's going to store the data somewhere, and they typically put it in a SQLite database. A SQLite database is just a single file database of a simple type, and SQL gives you, you use structured query language commands to add and modify records and such. That's a, a relational database, and typically contains uh, personally identifiable information. So if you look, uh, for example, at the Tinder app, which is a dating app, you'll find the Tinder SQLite file here in the Tinder folders, and um, within this database, You'll find text and images. In iOS, you'll find it in a subfolder of the library folder like you see here. In Android, it'd be a subfolder of the data folder. So another, that's one form of static analysis is just finding the stored data and reviewing it. Another form is to understand how the code works, to analyze how the code works. Now, one place to look is the manifest, androidmanifest.xml, contains the permissions for every app. So your app. Uh, will be here, and here's where all the permissions are. Access course and find location, that's the physical location of the phone, the network state, Bluetooth, the camera, and so on. Each app has the ability to use certain features on the phone, and uh, uh, this is where that is controlled. Um, all right, another tool you can use is Dex to Jar, among many tools. Um, this is something Android developers typically do not appear to understand is that the code that they distribute is not compiled down to assembly language or machine code. It's compiled down to an intermediate language called bytecode, and bytecode can easily be reversed back to Java. So they basically, the original source code is included with every app, uh, which is not true of comp things compiled, uh, native code compiled down to the machine code. And by the way, I've been asked questions about this pretty often. If you want to get into more detail of this next semester, there's two courses where we do this in great detail. Practical malware analysis is where we analyze malware on Windows, and the whole point is to understand how Windows works. You learn about the Windows API, the data structure, and how to debug Windows in both kernel land and user land to see exactly how malware works. And exploit development is similar on Windows, on, on Win Linux. This is how you break into Linux and make binary code that runs there. So both of these, uh, you learn a lot about assembly language and uh, machine language, and these other things like Java and such too. Um, so I'll mention that as you go ahead. You might want to take those if you want to get deeper into exactly how this all works. But anyway, so you can then do that static analysis. You can take an app that's not running, and you can turn it into readable code. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. And uh, all right, dynamic analysis would watch the behavior of the app. You just run the app and see what it does. So you can run tools that monitor the operating system, and you can also watch the network traffic. And one thing you often do is use Wireshark like this to just view the network traffic it sends, and you can see what kind of data it sends, and to whom it sends it. Um, one thing very easy to see this way is when it's spying on you, sending data to other servers. But almost all mobile apps spy on you to an unbelievable extent. This came out in a Brian Krebs article about it two weeks ago, where he found that every time an app appears, every time an ad appears on a web page, it sends about 200 requests telling everything about you to 200 potential advertisers so they can bid on how much they want to pay to put an ad on your page. So they do track you to an unbelievable extent, all mobile apps. And so, for example, if you look at a dating app like Tinder, um, there's something called deep linking where you connect social media within them. So you can see all the domains. It uses another Amazon, some Amazon, another Amazon, then some more objects here, something about MIT, another Amazon thing. So you can see the various web things it connects to, and you can try to figure out what it's sending to all of them. You can see where app user data is being stored, and if you find the physical location, then you'd know in what state you need to get a search warrant to search it. Um, that's one possible avenue of, uh, of investigation. Here's the kind of, uh, just a list you'd find from, uh, it looks maybe a proxy server. I'm not quite sure what tool they use for this, but it shows the various IP addresses it connects to, um, logging the network traffic. And if you look at the SQLite database, this is one of the many uh, privacy concerns about Tinder that came out. It gives the physical location of all the Tinder users near you because there's a feature to find somebody near me so I can physically meet up with them. And therefore, it has to know where everybody is, and your app has to know, and you can see that's just right in your, uh, in your database. So it's uh, physical tracking, and you can get more, more precise location about them, too. Um, here you get latitude and longitude, so you can physically locate people. So if you wanted to stalk somebody, you could do it in Tinder. That was an issue. So it has a SQLite database that has this data, contacts, videos, number, members, video messages, and so on. 
Uh, all right, the kind of inventory you'll find in there. Each app has their own database, and uh, you can analyze them to get the data stored in the app. Uh, yeah. A related but more on the, on the side questions. So on all these, uh, all the study we have done, especially with autopsy, you know, we use yeah. autopsy in order to discover, you know, to read a lot of information. You know. So, okay, basic questions. So, can I, but is it possible to delete that information? Well, you can just not install the app and then it won't have the data for that app. Uh, but a good bit of it is necessary for the fundamental operation. Like if your phone can ring, then your a phone company must know where you are. Uh, well, okay. And, uh, and the, the GPS app is keeping track of where you physically are and things like that. So I mean, uh, now it but is- For example, yeah, these yeah. SQL data that are stored. Well, that's created by the app. So if you don't install the app, it won't be there. Okay. That's the simplest way. But. Um, yeah. Also, there are some settings like that thing where it sends your data to all the advertisers. You can turn that off. You can turn off advertising tracking. Mm -hmm. It's mostly off in iOS by default. On Android, it's on, but you can turn it off. So you can make some limitation, but this is why the privacy experts get very upset. Uh, basically, you can't turn off enough to make any difference. That's why there was a, a, a joke video 10 years ago, Google opt-out village. You know, if you don't want Google to know everything about you, you pretty much have to like give up technology and live in a cave. I mean, everything you know, you deal with is sending reports back to Google. But I think not even to go to that extreme. But for example, I, I think about the shared references. No, if yeah. you have an app that needs to access, for example, your your contacts, that is yeah. shared automatically with other apps. So you're giving the authorization to one app, but then it it has a ripple effect even on the other. Well, if one app has access to your contacts, it doesn't give another app access to your contacts necessarily. Each app, presumably, you can choose whether you want to let you access your contacts. Yeah, theoretically, when you install it, a box will pop up saying this app is going to do all these things, Wi-Fi, contacts, Bluetooth. And now, in most modern, in modern versions, I think, of Android, you can actually uncheck them one by one if you're willing to limit the functionality of the app. Then was before with the, share, with the shared preferences of before, the system of shared preferences of before that were, were, were common. Were, were, yeah, before that, you just had yes or no. You either install the app, giving it all the permissions, or you don't install the app. Uh, modern versions of Android now let you choose, I think, line by line. But of course, if you do that, certain parts of the app won't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in principle, you can control it. And if you're going to like um, install your own custom ROM and take over the phone, that's what, you can also get a highly private phone. Um, there, there, are, there are custom ROMs that are limited. But of course, to make it private, you're going to lose a lot of features. So and. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting issue, and this is why the privacy experts are talking about this. We have let the intrusion of our privacy go to a really extreme extent here. Europe is clamping down on it. Europe is requiring more and more that you not do this. In Europe, you cannot make a database of information about people without telling them first what you're collecting that data for and getting their permission. <coughs> and once you have the data, you're not allowed to resell it to a third party without permission of the user. In America, there's no such protection, and that's why there's these data brokers that are just selling our data to everybody. Um, there's a lot of push to try to create a privacy law, but like all tech laws, there are very powerful tech lobbies. I just heard this this morning. I think it is Amazon or Google has one lobbyist in Washington for every eight legislators. So they have a lot of money to push back and prevent any privacy laws from being passed. And, uh, and of course, the... Uh, Republican administration is always about deregulation and letting the companies do more things like pollute and stuff. So I don't think we'll see any progress on this in the next several years, except um, to ban fact checking and things like that. Um, that was already in one of the uh, articles. Uh, they want to end CISA, the uh, Cybersecurity Insurance uh, Security Agency from the government, which is very useful because CISA issued an official statement in 2020 that the election had not been hacked by China. And the Republicans find that intolerable, so they want to end the cybersecurity agency entirely, and probably will do that, uh, so that they do not say any true statements about cybersecurity which would contradict the political statements they want to make. So we move into the disinformation age with lies in a textbook and stuff. Um, this is where uh, fascist governments tend to go. You know, they rewrite history, then they rewrite science, then they rewrite current events, and so on. Mm -hmm. So and that's why. The, uh, all the media is rushing down to like bend the knee and say, we will just obey you, we will print whatever you tell us to print, we'll stop printing the news, please don't hurt us. <laughs> and that's, uh, 
There are plenty, of, we've lived, plenty of other countries have lived through this. It's kind of a new thing here, but that's, that's what we're headed for here, it looks like. Yeah. What's that? Italian history. Oh, yeah, you guys had Ber Berlusconi was the same, right? Oh, gosh. Yeah, and before him, Mussolini. Yeah, yep, we have our, our orange Mussolini. Well, the major historical events, I think, uh, had a germ in, uh, in, uh, in the Italian land. This is, a, uh, this is a repeat. We all, before this, we had Joseph McCarthy. Um, this didn't get so much power, and we had the guy in uh, down south. There was a guy. Um, uh, the, the, the one that ran uh, from Alabama. That yeah, Alabama Mississippi. or Mississippi. There was a guy who was basically a dictator down there. It, it suddenly happens pretty often in politics. You put in a strong man because you're tired of this chaos and confusion. And of course, somebody benefits from that. There's a group he's for, and then after a while he gets paranoid and starts purging, and it's, it's always the same because it's, his real issue is to stay in power. Anyway. Um, Russia's been living through it longer than us. We'll see how long it goes here. Anyway, so in addition to the information you get from apps, there's photographs. And photographs are highly valued in court because it's very easy for people to understand what a photograph means. You don't have to argue about IP addresses or anything. Um, yeah, people getting stuff deleted via CPPA. Yes, I think they say they're trying to get things deleted by CC, the Child Protection Act. That's nearly impossible. The way to get things deleted is to use the Copyright Act, um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. That's the most uh, effective way to get something roof from the web. Anyway, um, so the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, this is uh, children that have been kidnapped. Um, and that's a big deal. It's a, it was the law enforcement top priority from the FBI for years until 9-11, and then it became number two after terrorism. But it's still a huge crime, and they're very concerned. That's why they have milk cartons with pictures of kids on it and all this stuff to try to catch the people that have kidnapped kids. And so they... Um, try to detect these images, and there have been many pushes to try to force the phone providers to scan every phone for child abuse images and automatically report them. Apple even promised to go along with this, where they would put a tool that would check the hash of all the images on your phone, and if it was a known image, it would turn you in, and their users rebelled and said this was an invasion of privacy, and they didn't do it. Um, but I think they're doing it on iCloud. Um, and so in Project Vic, is a uh, attempt to catch sex offenders and securing crime scenes. This is a huge database of child abuse photo hashes that's saved among, uh, shared among law enforcement, so they can hopefully detect this with things like photo DNA, is some kind of system of I think fuzzy hashing, where you hash parts of an image, so hopefully can identify the image even if it's been modified to some extent. Uh, so uh, here's a Facebook. This person um, took a selfie after committing murder. And it turned out that he had a picture of, she was wearing a belt that she had taken from the woman she murdered. And it was distinctive, and they were able to uh, figure that out. She was wearing the murder weapon in the selfie. Um, then there was To Catch a Predator, it was this TV show where they would go online and pretend to be a child and make a date for some adult to have sex with them. Then they would show up the TV cameras and humiliate the guy, which was really extreme. I think people killed themselves and such. Um, all right, and uh, there's extortion images out there a lot. This is a huge issue. Um, they go online, flirt with somebody, typically a young boy, trick them into sending nude pictures, then they threaten to send the nude pictures, like their teacher and their parents, unless they send more nude pictures and then demand more and more things. And a lot of the young men kill themselves, which is really a shame. Um, they get very, very upset. The humiliation is too much for them. Uh, it's a very serious crime, but there's a lot of this going on. Um, and uh, it's a shame. It's got to do with everybody having smartphones and being children and being naive. It's easy to trick them into doing stupid things with their smartphones, and then when, yeah, for some reason they're very easily manipulated with the threat of great humiliation. I, I'd like to think maybe their parents could be tolerant, and you know, but I know many women, just girls just can't even tell their parents they got pregnant or anything, they, anything like that. They're afraid of telling their parents, and they'll run away or kill themselves before they dare to put up with the humiliation of bidding something like that. that yeah. is supportive of a possible law that limits the use of cell phones to minors yes. 16 or 14 years old? A lot of people are talking about age gating, cell phones or social media, yeah. and because the evidence is very large that a large number of children suffer from social media usage, um, so far those laws are going absolutely nowhere in America. Uh, they are moving in Australia. Australia is apparently going to ban social media for people below 16 next year. The problem is, how do you verify their age? And uh, that's an unsolved problem. So we will see. But certainly, there are some people that want to do it here because there's a lot of study from psychologist Jonathan Haidt, I think, at New York University, did this research and showed that especially young girls suffer greatly from social media. 
they hate themselves more, they do more self-harm. They show that from 2012, they're right. spy. Right. The year in which social media exploded. Right, that's, that's his, he has evidence that uh, the social media is making them depressed and suicidal and yeah. stuff, and so it probably would be better to ban them. But uh, that, again, the, the tech lobbies are very powerful. Even it came out that Facebook had done their own internal study and concluded that Facebook was harming children and they just covered it up and continued to marketing to children. And they weren't even punished for that. Well, so, that lady that testified in Congress, I mean, I'm yeah. not hearing anything else about her. Lady. No, well, there, there's been actually no legislation. Various people are calling for it, but the pressure is not large enough to make it happen yet. It's, um, yeah, it's one of the unsolved problems. We need privacy legislation, other protection legislation about the internet, but basically the internet remains unregulated in America. And most other places. Nobody has really regulated it yet. I think the UK, I think I heard a couple of years ago, the UK banned pornography and you have to actually send your driver's license in somewhere to get permission to see pornography. But I don't know if that really happened. I know Utah tried to do that 10 years ago and somehow it didn't happen. Uh, various people have tried it. As far as I know, nobody has actually succeeded in implementing this in a way that works. And one problem, of course, is the kids will just lie and cheat to get in because it's where all their friends are. So until you actually successfully ban it everywhere, the kids will want to sneak by it. However, I continue to think that one, one important factor in the, uh, uh, about why we don't have um, yeah. we don't have appropriate laws on the internet and in social media is because legislators are old. They are not, that's true. They don't know about technology. Yeah, I think that's absolutely people. true. Yeah, that's true. That's one issue. The lead of ruling class is much older than the others. Also, of course, there's the issue of free speech. Do you really want to ban communication? Maybe you do. It's, it's an issue. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the, the, the issue of age, I think, is a, is a great sociological factor that I'm pursuing. Uh, well, a related one is banning TikTok. You know, it's a huge issue of that. We're going to see if that happens. That's supposed to take effect in a few months. I imagine it'll be canceled because Trump has said he's in favor of TikTok since they basically bribed him. He was against, he was initiator of the ban. What's that? He was against it. He was. Then the TikTok executives met with him and contributed to his campaign. Now he's for it. <laughs> like cryptocurrency was the same. He was against it. Then they gave him money. Now he's for it. Oh. It's a very simple government. You, you give money to the leader and now you're okay. So anyway, uh, so digital photographs, uh, your static photographs are stored, of course, on the various storage devices, uh, typically a FAT or XFAT, which is just a simple storage technique. And... Um, you often see this DCIM directory where it's stored, just the typical name for it. And so uh, there are huge repositories of images online, which has turned into a big deal. There's a company, I think, called Skyhook. No, it might have a different name now. It actually has been indexing all the photos and selling it to law enforcement so they can identify people by, and they've got all those photos from Facebook and many other sites. Um, but anyway, Facebook had an incredible number of faces on it, and they're tied to names and such, and Flickr and Instagram and Snapchat also all have huge databases. Snapchat claimed that images would vanish, so they were temporary, but that turned out not to be true because of course you can just kick a hatch or a screenshot, and sometimes I think there were defects in the app where in fact the image was stored and it could be found. So um, anyway, all these things create images and they're useful. The EXIF is the most common format used. This is a way to store files. JPEGs are an EXIF type format, and they often store extra information, like the name of the camera, the registered owner of the camera, the date and time of the photograph, and the GPS coordinates, latitude and longitude of the photograph. Um, so that's extremely useful, and most phones will store all that stuff by default. Um, so a raster graphic is the simplest kind of image where it just records the color of every pixel in a grid of pictures to turn an image into a bunch of numbers, and that's a raw image or a bitmap if you do it that way. The problem with it is those images are very large files, yeah. and you don't really need all that information, so there are various ways to compress it. Ping compresses it with a lossless compression like zip, so it's smaller, but it still contains complete information about every pixel. JPEGs actually lose some of the information. They're carefully designed to hopefully remove the frequencies you can't see on the image to make it smaller. But you can compress it to different amounts, and the more you compress it, the lower the quality gets. Um, so JPEG is very popular because of its compression. Uh, bitmap is Windows default uncompressed file. Ping is lossless and probably the most common these days on the internet. Um, and GIF has been around for a really long time. Um, it, the idea is it's a workable file. If you have to do some work on the image, you work on the video. Yeah, yeah, you do all these different images are available for it, and if usually a drawing program like Photoshop will have its own format, and then you save it in one of these images when you want to publish it. 
Um, yeah, and so GIF is one that's, uh, the thing about GIF is there are only 256 colors. So it's good for logos and cartoons, but an actual image of a real photographic scene, it loses some of the color information. And TIFF is another one, working like GIF. Uh, so in Windows, uh, and, and all, there are thumbnails stored, so you can see little pictures of the images. And sometimes those thumbnails remain even after you delete the full-size images. So sometimes they're useful. You can find them in the app data folder on Windows machines. And another type of graphic is vector graphics, where instead of recording the color of every pixel, you just record a mathematical description of it. So your image contains things like circles and lines, and you just have a mathematical representation, and so your browser draws it. And so if you zoom in, it remains high quality. Your browser just redraws it at quality. So that's another way to do it. Again, not really appropriate for like photographs, but good for things like logos and cartoons and things like that. Uh, Wikipedia, I think, about most of the, uh, the pictures on Wikipedia are SVG. I think. NVIDIA? In NVIDIA, uh, picture, uh, uh, photos. Yeah. Well, uh, I haven't seen photos made out of vector graphics. Uh, that's interesting. In principle, you could do it. In practice, it's uh, not usually most commonly done. But maybe, maybe some people are doing it now. SVG is the extension, Scalable Vector Graphics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so then there's the issue of evidence admissibility. If you do find this evidence, is it admissible in court? What they really like is called best evidence, and that is the original device. Here is the computer. Here is the phone. Here is the gun. You know, here's the actual object that was used in the crime. Now, you can use a duplicate that's unaltered um, or a printout and things like that um, if you have a verification, like from the hash value, that this is a genuine copy. Uh, digital photos can be enhanced and adjusted a lot. Um, and we've seen, if you do the AI class, you can even de-blur them and such. Um, here's one where a criminal actually posted this image, and in order to hide, they used like a swirling uh, function in Photoshop to blur away his face. But the problem is, this is not really erasing the image. You know, covering it with like black square would really erase the pixels, so you can't get in. But here, you can just twist it back out, right? Just with a mathematical expression. And they were able to do that and reconstruct the face enough to recognize him. So uh, this is a fairly common flaw. Criminals have sent supposedly anonymized images around and they were able to reconstruct them enough to catch the criminal. Um, all right, let me check for comments here. Uh, deleting stuff, yeah, CPP, yeah, talking about, we talked about that already. All right, so let's try a Kahoot. This is chapter 10 and I've got them here. All right. Let me make this uh, narrower so you can see the number. All right. talking about these political issues, it is a huge problem. I mean, if you're going to remove even like false medical information from the web or ban apps or such, then you're to some extent restricting free speech. And you could argue that you're better off not doing that because pretty soon the government will just be putting out propaganda. That's why Biden tried to make a Department of Government Truth to remove the false medical information from the web. And even that fell afoul of people saying, you know, now you have a government ministry of truth. and. Uh, most people have settled on the old-fashioned technique. It's better just to have the government not to censor anything and let the people decide what to believe or not. It's a, it's a very thorny issue. There's no simple answer. And so you could say it's up to the parents to decide their kids can do things and not for the government to say nobody can use TikTok. That's an argument that goes pretty far in America. Yeah, I think he wanted, yeah, he wanted to limit soda. And of course, also tobacco, we totally do tax just to discourage use. So sometimes we're able to put in this nanny state stuff to limit what people can do. Sometimes the argument for freedom wins. There's an internal pushback. Yeah. 
is it real freedom in that case? Because there's a, there's a sort of, I don't want to say as enslavement to, to the taste or to the nicotine that in the case of cigarettes, but I don't think the person is free the way they decide if you are free to do whatever. Right, that's the issue. And maybe children aren't really free to decide because they aren't mature enough. That's the argument, yeah. And it goes back and forth. See what happens here. Oh, it's, uh, TikTok has changed their algorithm to there. There we go. Good. Or whatever this thing is. Code. All right. All right. So, which technology is used to store data in mobile apps? SQLite, the most common database used. All right. All right, so which organization includes private and law enforcement? These are public-private partnerships. Law enforcement has been talking about them a lot over the last couple of days. But Project Vic is the organization has to do with trying to do something about uh, exploitation of children, and I think also uh, people that are um, sla into sex slavery. Uh, people that are imported under false promises and then uh, forced to participate in sex work. All right, so which company made misleading claims that the image would vanish quickly? <laughs> They claimed the image would vanish, but it turned out not to be completely true. All right. And which one of these is a lossy format? JPEGs distort the image if you compress it too much. Good. Let me stop this recording.